So hi everybody, I'd love to introduce Chigong Lee from University of Toronto, who, who sits at the intersection of reinforcement learning, machine learning, and you know industrial practice and the mechanical engineering. So welcome, Chigong. Okay, so uh, sh should I go? Yeah, please. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Greg, for the kind invitation and introduction. So uh, uh, other than the screen that I'm sharing, I cannot say anything else on my screen, so I, I have no idea how many are there and the questions that you may raise, but uh, interrupt me using voice uh, in case you have any questions. So uh, thank you everyone attending this talk. And again, uh, this is uh, Chigun Lee. Uh, I'm a professor at University of Toronto. And reinforcement learning has been uh, really the direction of research that uh, I have been pushing uh, so hard in the last uh, five, six years. And before then, uh, I didn't do uh, machine learning at all. So I, I did a traditional uh, operations research-based approach uh, and came across a project that I miserably failed uh, due to the complexity. And that was the motivation why I switched to a uh, machine learning approach. So since 2017 or 16, around that time, uh, I have done uh, you know, machine learning research exclusively. The topic that I have today uh, for you is uh, reinforcement learning, which is known to be uh, notoriously expensive uh, in training. Uh, there are three branches of machine learning, as you already know. Uh, so uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And uh, supervised and unsupervised learning requires a bunch of data. Reinforcement learning, on the other hand, does not require data, but it, but it requires uh, environment uh, to which the learning agent can interact with. Sounds fantastic, right? No data, well, that's uh, too good to be true. But this interaction uh, turns out to be quite expensive because by interacting, the learning agent will have to collect data uh, on its own. And uh, if the data is previously collected and can be reused, uh, we can save a lot of uh, costs of uh, data collection. But since reinforcement learning requires uh, interaction, meaning online uh, data collection, uh, it ends up being even more expensive than other branches of machine learning. So the main focus of our research in the past couple of years is really to tackle this issue by improving the efficiency of the learning algorithm so that we can achieve the same quality of solution using much less uh, samples. And therefore, the topic today is a sample efficient method for reinforcement learning. At the end, I uh, put uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning, uh, which may not have a strong connection to the main topic that I am delivering today. Uh, but uh, I like it so much that I put it, but depending on how much time that I have, uh, I may just skip uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning uh, completely. This is my uh, plan uh, for the next 40 minutes, uh, giving you a brief introduction of MDP and basics of reinforcement learning. Uh, before I switch it to uh, a few projects that we did in our research group, focusing on uh, sample efficiency of reinforcement learning. So that's uh, item number two here. So let me switch to a uh, pointer. Oops. Oops. <laughs> OK. Oh, OK. I think I'm clicking the, it's moving in opposite direction. Sorry about that. I gave you a sneak peek. <laughs> but anyway, so let me switch to uh, laser pointer. So in part two, I'm going to share some of the project that we recently completed in improving sample efficiency of reinforcement learning algorithm, followed by a uh, same idea applied to a different uh, scenario. Here, Technically speaking, we are not improving sample efficiency, but we are still reducing the cost of sampling by training 
our reinforced learning agent in virtual environment. Once trained, then we can deploy the policy to the real world. So that seems to be real. And number four is multi-agent reinforcement learning, where we focus on uh, mechanism design. So there are a bunch of agents interacting each other, and they are all selfish, so that they will converge to some sort of equilibrium solution. And now we have additional uh, agent overlooking how all these guys are doing, and notice that the team does not achieve the ideal outcome then this control agent uh, try to intervene by shuffling the reward among those multiple agents and even changing the number of agents of certain type in the team so that as a team, the objective can be improved. So this is mechanism design. So we have done some work on uh, this topic. But this is a uh, somewhat unrelated topic, so depending on how much time that I have, I may uh, completely skip item number four. And finally, I'm going to uh, close my talk by sharing some summary and thoughts on uh, reinforcement learning. So dynamic optimization is uh, the type of a problem that reinforcement learning is trying to tackle. Dynamic optimization is different from traditional uh, static optimization where problem definition remains the same once set up. However, in real world, the problem definition is changing, such as in case you are investing in a stock market, maybe the economic condition is changing so that the probability distribution for the future stock price uh, is changing. And that means, uh, you know, problem definition is changing in, in some way. So in dynamic optimization, the solution is adaptive to the changing condition. Therefore, solution to dynamic optimization can be uh, more useful in real world. And by, well, this may not be that straightforward, by fixing the changing component, maybe you can turn dynamic optimization problem to static version, but, uh, may not be very realistic though. So in dynamic optimization, the decision maker will be placed in a particular condition that can be summarized as a vector SN. So this is a state using the terminology of Markov decision process. At time N, in reaction to this condition, the decision maker will have to take an action DN and once action is applied, then the environment will provide immediate feedback given as f of n. If the decision maker focuses on this immediate return, then this is to my object. Once the feedback is given, the system will evolve continuously to a new state in which the decision maker will have to take another action to get another feedback. And this will just go on forever. And the way state is transitioning uh, is a stochastic. And sometimes uh, action can be taken stochastically. And of course, return can be given stochastically. So there are a lot of uncertainties. But the point is the situation is evolving to a new condition over time so that myopic approach may not achieve satisfactory result. So when the decision maker take connection DN, the decision maker will have to consider the subsequent result in the future. So that's a dynamic optimization, which can be traditionally formulated as Markov decision process. And there are a bunch of applications uh, around us, such as optimal maintenance of five million uh, dollar uh, whole truck in mining site and since this is so expensive uh, we want this equipment up and running all the time so that we can get the most uh, productivity out of the mining site and therefore we install a bunch of sensors and assess the quality of the machine the health condition and given those sensory information 
we have to take optimal action such as inspection, repair, even replacement. By doing so, we can maximize the performance of a mining site. So this is an example of dynamic optimization. Another optimization can be robotics control. So you see uh, Atlas from Boston Dynamics. And if you see those uh, motor control as a action in markup decision process, then this robot can be controlled using the policy found by a markup decision process. And state here can be maybe the tilt angle of the spine of the robot or velocity of the robot or distance uh, toward uh, the barrier uh, ahead of the robot on the ground. So considering all these uh, situation and condition, the robot will have to control the force and rotational velocity of a bunch of motors uh, at the joint of this robot so that rather than falling on the ground, a uh, robot can jump over the log and you know, achieve the mission that was given to the robot. So robotic control can be an example of uh, dynamic optimization. And finally, game is another example. So you're looking at a chessboard. These problems can be formulated as something called Markov decision process. There are a bunch of uh, standard algorithms such as policy valuation and value iteration algorithm and so on. But these algorithms are notoriously expensive in computation. And that's what happens to me back in 2016. I miserably failed in solving the problem from real world. And that's when I switched to uh, alternative approaches. Speaking of complexity, uh, this complexity uh, is not new. Uh, back in 1950s and 60s, uh, mathematician known as uh, Shannon uh, investigated a complexity of chess game. And he estimated uh, those numbers. So number of pairs of moves between two players is about 1,000. And length of a game is about uh, 40 moves. And between number of actions possible between two players and duration of the game, he came up with a lower bound for the number of different ways of uh, this game can be uh, played out. So that number is 10 to the 120th. This number is uh, ridiculously large, but you may not have a sense of how big this number can be. So I have some alternative numbers here. So number of atoms in the entire universe is only 10 to the 81st. So uh, the number of different ways of playing a single chess game is virtually uh, infinite times more complex than the number of atoms in the entire universe. And the number of nanoseconds since the Big Bang is only uh, 10 to the 26th. So that's how complex this uh, chess game is. And if you tackle this chess game using a Markov decision process, then the Markov decision process, the solution method is uh, more or less uh, enumeration method. So that to be truly optimal, we have to consider all possible uh, consequences of a certain action. And given that there are so many different scenarios of the game, this enumeration method will fail. So reinforcement learning uh, becomes an alternative uh, given the high complexity. And to me, at first, reinforcement learning algorithm was approximation algorithm for MDP, but uh, that's not all. So reinforcement learning is also a learning algorithm so that we can avoid feeding all these uh, model information to be able to tackle dynamic optimization problem formulated as a Markov decision process. So uh, really, there's a lot of savings in terms of uh, formulation and also uh, solving for optimal policy. The diagram uh, shows the basic principles of learning. We have learning agent here taking, at the beginning, random action without knowing too much about the problem given, but 
environment is kind enough to provide feedback. Oh, so you did action AT from state ST, so uh, immediate feedback is RT, so maybe minus 100. So don't do it again from this state. Agent will remember this experience and using different actions from different states. And once agent does this maybe a million times, then agent may have relatively good idea given state, good actions and bad actions so that agent can perform the task uh, much, much better than the beginning. So this is basically the idea of reinforcement learning. To implement this learning algorithm, we have to learn a lot of things. And at the core of this learning algorithm, we have something called value function. Value function can be understood as long-term intuition. So when you are making a decision in dynamically evolving situation, you not only have to consider the immediate cost that you have to pay, but also the resulting consequence. So if I make left turn there because uh, the, the road to the right seems quite congested, but once I make left turn, uh, the distance uh, toward my home can be 20% more. That's the consequence. So without knowing that intuition from the resulting states, you cannot make optimal decision. So the reinforcement learning really uh, focuses on learning this intuition function uh, called uh, value function. So here's an example. Suppose that you are in this maze and there are 50 different locations vertically and another 50 horizontally. And therefore there are 250 possible locations that you can be at. And from each location, you can take one of four actions moving up, down, left, and right. And now we have to learn this intuition function. So from location 1025, so 1025 here, if I move upward, then what is the long-term return? If I move downward, what is the long-term return? So if I know the long-term satisfaction after taking certain action from a certain state, then using these values, I can make optimal decision. So in reinforcement learning, we try to estimate this long-term return for every possible combination of action and states through sampling. So this is exactly what will happen using one of the ancient algorithms called cube learning. So we have matrix, which is a placeholder for intuition values, and we got 250 rows so each row is corresponding to each location in the maze using the terminology of mdp each row is corresponding to one state for each state there are four actions so we got four columns so q1 left is long-term result when i use left action from state one and all the way to Q1 down. So if I go down from the same state one, then what is the long-term return? Once you estimate those uh, 1,000 different values, then optimal decision can be straightforward. You go through individual row and finding column for maximum entry. For instance, if Q1 left is larger than all the other entries from the same row corresponding to location one, then moving to the left from location one is better than any other actions. So by going through this matrix, you can optimize your behavior responding to the location that you are in. So this is basically the idea of pure learning. But the problem is there are so many to estimate. So in this case, there are 1,000 numbers that I have to estimate via sampling. And if you need, say, uh, 50 samples for reasonably accurate estimate, then 50, 50 times 1,000, that is 50,000 uh, samples. So you have to do 
50,000 trials to be able to optimally navigate through this maze. That 50,000 may sound uh, something small, but uh, many problems in real world, that, that number can be a million, even trillion. So this estimation problem will become really, really expensive. And therefore, uh, we have been trying to achieve uh, convergence or this learning uh, using uh, as you know a small number of samples as possible. So let me skip some slide and jump to some of the project that we did uh, recently. So the main idea here is transfer learning. And what you see on the screen is the traditional uh, learning diagram for reinforcement learning algorithm. Imagine that you are previously trained with a certain task, in this case, a tricycle. And new task given to you is bicycle. Bicycle can be a bit more complicated task, but you can reuse some of the knowledge that you gained from training of tricycle. So this is the idea of transfer learning. The question is, uh, what knowledge can I transfer? And in case there are multiple tasks that you are previously trained, from what previous task should I transfer knowledge? So there are a lot of questions that we have to answer in order to complete this pipeline of knowledge transfer. So some of the project that we did, which I'm going to share with you today, uh, all focusing on this uh, transferring pipeline. First study, which was uh, published in back in uh, 2018 in NIPS, uh, I think this is the last conference before they changed the name. So in this algorithm, we enhanced the traditional reinforcement learning algorithm with Bayesian inferencing, assuming there are multiple experts providing advices to the learning agent. However, the quality of the advice from those multiple experts is unknown, and some are good, some are bad, so that the learning agent will have to learn not only how to navigate in this grid world, but also which of the experts are more you know, uh, credible. So for just demonstration purpose, I'm using this uh, single example uh, to explain. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is the setting here that the um, you want to figure out the trustworthiness of an expert, or is it a state-specific thing that in this uh, region of the state space, this expert is trustworthy, in this other region, this other expert? Good question. So we are here. Uh, we we are just evaluating the, uh, how credible the expert is, uh, regardless of the state information here. But in the next project, uh, we do have a state-specific uh, transporting algorithm. But Excellent. in this particular approach, uh, we do not consider uh, state-specific transfer. All right, great, thanks. So here, uh, the agent will have to navigate from uh, starting node to goal node in this five by five grid world. And navigation uh, will give a tremendous uh, uh, reward, positive reward. And each movement between grid will cost some energy consumption so that the reward can be minus one. And arriving at the goal node is not the only mission given. So the agent will have to collect uh, objects, one, two, three, four, uh, given in these locations exactly according to that sequence, one, two, three, four. So we assumed uh, existence of five experts. The first expert knows optimal solution, so that advice from this guy is always optimal. However, learning agent had no way to know uh, at the beginning. The second advice uh, is based on good heuristics or high quality, but not necessarily optimal. The third expert provide no advice. So uh, advice of zero contains no information. 
And the fourth advice, uh, provide random advice uh, generated from uniform distribution between minus 20 and 20. And then the last advice uh, is based on minus one times optimal value function. And this is performance graph. So the black curve shows our loss function over number of triers. As you can see, it goes on quite rapidly and converge. But worse than this orange curve, this orange curve was generated assuming single expert who is optimal, right? So when advice is coming from optimal expert, no other experts, then that's the best scenario so that there is no way for our algorithm to outperform that you know, ideal situation. Interesting uh, curve here is green curve where advice that only advice available is a random advisor or expert and the algorithm can never converge here as you can see so in this approach uh, we assumed there are some additional information sources whose quality is unknown but by using bayesian inferencing uh, as we learn how to navigate we also learn the quality of the advices from different sources so that we can accelerate our learning speed. The second example uh, is a state-specific transform. So uh, again, we use Bayesian uh, framework here to assess how similar the current uh, situation is to some of the situations that agents uh, previously uh, experienced. So again, here I'm using a simple example. So in this example, we have a target task. This is you know, marble task, where the maze consists of maybe four different sub mazes. And the agent was previously experienced with uh, those mazes. And as you can see, this maze is identical to this maze, so that when agent is learning somewhere around here, the agent may be able to recognize that situation around here is quite similar to some of the situations that the agent experienced. So this algorithm is to uh, allow the agent to identify those source tasks based on the similarity, and then transfer uh, the knowledge from the source task to the target task. And assuming there are multiple tasks covering uh, some sections of the target task that the reinforcement learning agent is currently uh, facing. So again, this algorithm was uh, published in uh, 2021 in UAI. This is, the, uh, this is uh, another example from the same uh, publication. Uh, so here we have Luna Lander trying to land on the landing pad between two flags. And we assume the three uh, previously trained skills, uh, hovering, landing, and descending is another skill set. And depending on the altitude of the Luna Lander, uh, we have to transfer skills appropriately. Uh, for instance, when the altitude is large, then hovering can be useful skill. But as the lunar lander is descending and approaching to the ground, and when uh, altitude is small, then landing is the skill that we have to use. So graph to the right shows uh, progression through a uh, training. So at the beginning, uh, the guy has no idea. So it's just randomly adapt uh, previously uh, trained skills. So uh, hovering all the way down and crash, or maybe landing from the top and crash. But as training is progressing, uh, I think the way it goes down becomes a bit more sophisticated, but still not good enough. But when the training is all completed, as you can see here, uh, when altitude is high, then uh, the Luna Lander uh, adopts um, a hovering skill. And as altitude is uh, going down, then switching to very briefly 
uh, ascending scale and eventually landing scale, and mostly uh, land uh, in the landing pad successfully. So um, this color graph shows the progression in terms of transferring a different type of skill set depending on the state that the agent is situated. So question, this yeah. seems, this has very much the flavor of what people with uh, in the climate modeling community do. They have 20, 30 different simulation types that are good in different parts of the world. And they mm -hmm. do things like averaging or bias correction, where they just predict the error of the different models and so on. Mm -hmm. This seems rather useful in that scenario where you don't know which simulation to trust in which regions of the Earth's, like, different regions of the earth and it's you know the wind is uh, the hotter year the colder year mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly so in this case we are transferring uh, optimally trained uh, policy so some sort of information regarding that policy but uh, later in another project uh, we have some metric uh, by which you can measure similarity between the target task and uh, many of the source tasks so that in terms of dynamics so climate modeling uh, maybe dynamics is the uh, you know part of the model that is being captured so if you can measure the similarity between the real climate that you are facing and some of the simulation ones then you can uh, assign you know score differently to different dynamics model so that you can learn based on mixture of the dynamics. So that uh, is possible. So I think that would be more uh, suitable uh, approach than the one that you are seeing on the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, this is, uh, I think, uh, something related to the uh, project that I mentioned uh, five seconds ago. Let me skip those equations. Uh, we applied this algorithm to uh, COVID-19 uh, shutdown policy optimization using SIR model. And so this is the uh, some of the uh, performance graph. So uh, the scenario that us, we assumed was we have optimal shutdown policy for alpha variant whose transmission rate is lower. But now uh, delta variant arrived and tr transmission rate is I think uh, twice or three times higher but much higher. And if you use the same optimal shutdown policy without noticing the arrival of new variant, then uh, the shutdown policy is not optimal and causing a lot of death and costs. So this is a scenario where you use the optimal shutdown policy from alpha variant when it is in fact delta variant out there then the number of deaths is almost 60,000 uh, based on that SIR model simulation. And using our algorithm, we can detect the difference and transfer the knowledge and then uh, use this you know, additional uh, information from previous tasks to quickly uh, train a new shutdown policy on the new dynamics. And uh, as a result of this algorithm, uh, we were able to reduce the number of deaths uh, quite significantly here. So this is another example of uh, transfer learning. So focusing on uh, dynamics mismatch between uh, different tasks. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to the next uh, section where uh, the main topic is uh, sim to real. So it's the same idea, transfer learning but the source task is now virtual and the target task is real, but idea is similar. By using virtual source task, we train our reinforcement learning agent on the virtual system using a lot of samples. So in that sense, we are not improving sample efficiency, but samples in virtual environments is very, very cheap so that we can reduce the sampling costs using this training pipeline. So same idea, but we replace source test with a virtual model and target task as a physical model so that we train our agent on virtual system so that we deploy optimal uh, 
policy to the physical robot without breaking the physical robot. However, the main challenge here is reward transfer. That's relatively easy. We have pretty good grip on reward definition between those two environments. But the main challenge is the dynamics. So when you rotate control motor by certain force and certain direction, the virtual robot moves, the end effect moves by five centimeters. When you apply the same control to the physical robot, the end effect moves only three centimeters so that optimal policy on the virtual robot may not be optimal on the physical system. And this is a challenge. So we have to detect the discrepancy in the behavior. So basically using the terminology of Markov decision process, you have to identify discrepancy in transition probability matrices. To do so, we need samples from the physical system. To calibrate the two models perfectly, we need so many samples from the physical robot so that this sim to wheel will fit the original purpose of sampling cost reduction. So we are back to scale one. So our main focus in this research was how can we do this calibration using extremely limited samples from the physical system? So that was the main goal of our research, which I'm going to uh, share with you now. So we have physical, we have virtual robot in the computer. We have physical uh, robot in the world. And we try to uh, minimize the number of samples. And through those mathematics, I'm going to skip all of this. And this is a pseudocode. This is diagram uh, illustrating our algorithm structure. But this is the performance graph. So this is graph from our algorithm. Those two graphs are from existing algorithm using different number of samples. And the graph that you see here represent transition probability. On the x-axis, we have state after one transition from a specific state and specific action. And the red graph shows probability distribution over the new state after one random transition. And our goal is to change the dynamics of the source task to something similar to the target task. But using existing algorithm, using only 500 samples, the calibration is not very good. So as you can see, this is the probability distribution over the resulting states after calibration using 500 samples. And this distribution is very different from target distribution, no good. But as we increase the sample size from 500 to 100,000, then calibration uh, is improving so that it is almost identical. So the target distribution, which is red, and calibrated distribution, which is green, they are almost coinciding here. So now that the behaviors are the same between those two domains, then we can apply optimal policy from the calibrated virtual model to the physical system. But 100,000 samples, that's too many, right? So as you take 100,000 samples, then the robot will go through wear and tear, and maybe you need uh, three robots uh, before you uh, successfully train uh, one robot. So that's not acceptable. So using our approach here, uh, 500 sample allow us to calibrate our uh, model, which is given in green, not as good as uh, the middle graph, but uh, good enough. So this is a performance graph of calibration algorithm that we developed. And so using this, yes. So should we be thinking of this, you're adapting the simulation to be closer to reality, or you're adapting the policy trained in the simulation to be a policy that's good for reality? 
Good question. So for now, on this particular graph, we are trying to calibrate the simulation to the real environment. And we are not manipulating the simulation. Sometimes the simulation uh, is black box, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we just keep the source as is, but we are creating our own uh, model given in uh, green. So we don't need to know uh, the internal structure of the simulation. We can simply add one more layer of dynamics. So uh, we have a simulation dynamics at the bottom, and we have additional stochastic layer. So every stochastic transition underneath will go through one more uncertainty transition. And as a result of those two layered uh, transition, uh, we have this calibrated dynamics matching to the target. So this sounds a lot like an LSTM where one layer is a simulation, the other layer is a neural net, and then we get the final behavior. Yeah, possibly, but uh, but calibration of MDP has uh, extremely high uh, dimensionality, right? So mm -hmm. state space, uh, you may have uh, 1 million states, but we are talking about transition. So that mm -hmm. 1 million to 1 million, so the num number of numbers that we have to calibrate is 1 million times 1 million, not to mention policy. So if you use different policy, then of course you have new uh, you know, matrix like this. So you have to also multiply the dimensionality of the policy so that the number of numbers that we have to uh, calibrate is just incredible. So maybe, I'm not sure, uh, Okay, uh, so yeah. I mean, that kind of idea. approach may work, yeah. But so conceptually, I, I yeah, in this direction because uh, it's it. In addition to control, this is also I have a simulation. It's incomplete. Neural net mm -hmm. fix my simulation, and the layer, the approach that you're describing, right, right. Sounds like I have a heat equation that's accurate when mm -hmm. there's no high heat gradients, right, right. there's no vortices. Yeah. But the moment there are high heat gradients, my equation is not mm -hmm. accurate. Well, yeah, yeah, a neural yeah. net can fix it up partially for those scenarios. Mm -hmm. But if you just mm -hmm. layer it on top of the simulation. Yeah. Theoretically, the approach that you're talking about may work. But uh, there is a lot of uh, you know, calibration that you have to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can easily overfit unless your sample size is enormous. But remember here, uh, we are taking samples from a physical system. So the sample size cannot be big enough to avoid overfitting. So then the intuition of your approach is that instead of using an LSTM or a neural net, your extra layer is far simpler. It's just a random state transition. Problem. Right. So in fact, the calibration itself is an optimization problem in our mm -hmm. approach. So we are solving a reinforcement learning problem for calibration. And on top, we are solving reinforcement learning problem to get optimal policy. So uh, conceptually, there are two reinforcement learning algorithms running in parallel. OK, that makes sense. Yeah. OK, so we applied this to Muzoko. So uh, this is not uh, sim to real. This is sim to sim in some sense, because uh, getting a physical system and working on the physical system is very time consuming and expensive. So uh, we use Muzoko and intentionally uh, broke some of the dynamics here. So in case of inverted pendulum, so we increase the gravity and try to uh, address that you know, dynamics difference due to different gravity. Uh, in the second example, we broke one of the three actuators and things like that. And then the graph that you see here is the performance of the final policy, not calibration performance. So the green graph is the quality of policy that we found using our algorithm. So especially when the sample size is small, our green graph is much, much higher than blue graph, uh, which is the existing algorithm. And by the way, this yellow graph is also our algorithms, one of the variants of our approach. So you can consider uh, uh, yellow and green are both our algorithm. So with now we are trying this to a uh, real robot because uh, sim to real was not actually sim to real, it was more like a sim to sim. So we now uh, have this robot and testing out our approach uh, on real uh, sim to real pipeline. Uh, but for the interest of time, let me just go through. So we are using NVIDIA uh, physical uh, physics engine uh, simulator 
to create our robot. And uh, the training is ideally all vision based here. So we have this uh, virtual camera so that robot can learn based on video input. And the good thing about this approach is now, uh, once we have calibrated robot, we can clone them so that we can uh, train over multiple computers overnight. Uh, of course, the algorithm uh, will have to be designed specifically so that we can take advantage of this parallel training. But these are all in progress. But the point here is we are trying, we are trying to test out our algorithm on real sim to real pipeline. And then this section is uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. So we uh, we have done some uh, mechanism design, but probably I will have to skip. And finally, so this is my last slide. So um, I think this machine learning uh, bandwagon is not just a bandwagon, in my opinion. It's a, it's a good you know uh, a solution to many uh, complex problems out there in terms of modeling and solution procedure. And also thanks to uh, deep learning, uh, we can now address problem end to end. So in one of the projects that I shared, we are using uh, video input uh, for robot so that we don't have to factorize the you know, uh, state information for the robot, but the robot can process uh, the image information uh, directly. And thanks to uh, you know relatively uh, accessible technology to uh, non-vision experts like myself, uh, we can now address problem end to end. These are all uh, good things due to uh, machine learning. Uh, so um, I think a more realistic problem can be uh, tackled. However, many machine learning algorithms are still uh, uh, you know, immature, I think particularly reinforcement learning algorithm, in my opinion, has a long way to go uh, before uh, being uh, practically useful. So uh, we have to uh, be aware of that. And But uh, I can see uh, opportunities uh, when we combine uh, machine learning with some other uh, areas. Uh, and there are a bunch of uh, applications that can benefit from uh, the advancement that can be uh, made uh, in, in the near future. So this is my last slide uh, concluding my talk. So thank you, everyone. And I, I still have seven to uh, six minutes for uh, questions and answers. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, one thing is like the generality of the tools we have right now uh you've run into several different problems let's say in your robots and there's a lot of system control simulation kinds of uh, challenges to what extent can you use off the shelf reinforcement learning tools to optimize them and to what extent you have to do custom work for every single one uh i'm not sure whether there is a uh, uh off the shelf type of reinforcement learning tools uh, uh i'm not aware of there, there should be uh but uh, I have never used any of those. Uh, we usually implement everything from scratch. Uh, sometimes you use existing code out there, but uh, we are doing uh, Python programming uh, line by line here. So um, I'm not saying there's nothing, but I am not aware of any. But uh, And also, I would be quite surprised if there's any. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm thinking there's like, uh, like TF agents or Acme or, I mean, there's like, this is our specifically the Google ones, but there's many mm -hmm. other ones. They're just mm -hmm. libraries of algorithms, but they're they're good for papers. We know that uh, because mm -hmm. that's what the papers were written for. But in actual applications, the dynamic spaces are well different, more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are using in many applications uh, uh, those algorithms are publicly available out there. So when we use TDPG, uh, we we start from TDPG algorithm out there and then modify and improve and combine. So that seemed to be all research that we did. Uh, the baseline algorithm um, is doesn't have to be a specific algorithm, right? So development of TDPG is not the goal that we have, but how to use TDPG so that calibration can be done more effectively. That's what we did. So again, there we use a stable baseline uh, for RL algorithm, but the design of the algorithm is, uh, I think, uh, 
a larger scale than one DDPG. So we use those algorithms out there, and maybe some of them uh, might have been implemented by a Google employee, I'm sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, so yeah, we are using those uh, products, uh, you know, from uh, GitHub and, and and so on. Yeah. So it yeah. it works uh, if we understand what's going on and nicely combine and understand all these pros and cons of different type of algorithms given the application. Uh, it it may work, and it actually worked in some application that uh, I, I I was working on. Okay, and then I'm getting a lot of flavors from your work of combining well multiple experts, but really I'm thinking multiple simulations. You have uh, different models of what should be the same robot, but they capture different uh, things with different fidelity, different models mm -hmm. of the climate, different right. models of mm -hmm. well, which is the bit relevant bit a bit of a lunar lander. Are you gonna mm -hmm. have? different bits there right, so right. to what extent is it feasible to start combining different well people's opinions about how something works i mean usually mm -hmm. scientists are have mm -hmm. many models of the same phenomenon in pretty much yeah. every field right so i think that's a very good point i've never uh you know thought about that possible application but uh by combining some of the work that we did here, uh, we can uh, address the problem that you just talked about right so we have this calibration algorithm we have transforming algorithm so that given multiple simulations out there, maybe we can uh, calibrate to a mixture of the existing simulation rather than calibrating against one simulation, right? So yeah, so the, the, the approach that you suggested uh, sounds uh, very relevant and I think uh, possibly doable too. Yeah, because in, in fact, your last thing was you have a simulation, you have another layer on top of it, Mm -hmm. Well, your previous work was several simulations and arbitrating them. So that mm -hmm. unification seems very valuable. I have as many opinions as I want, and the mm -hmm. layer is the one that federates them. Right, right. To make an, an actually good simulation that figures mm -hmm. out. Yeah, 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 I, I agree. Uh, I think that's uh, possible. So then maybe like, let me take it in a very different direction. Um, large language models, the ones that are sort of working today, I mean, they are wrong all the time and one one way of fixing them is to connect mm -hmm. them to simulations or some ground truth describing what mm -hmm. what the words were referring to when they were spoken or when you're generating text you know have a consistent backbone of meaning i mm -hmm. guess can you have you thought of any connections to put like this backbone of model behind the, the, the words generated by these models mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, I, I know only the basics of language model. I have not worked on language model, but uh, we have used uh, language model uh, similar to what sequence to sequence learning mm -hmm. to uh, create uh, something we call uh, digital twin, similar to the simulation model. So we trained a sequence of numbers from some industrial system, and we measure something very expensive to measure for the purpose of training. Now that we have uh, you know, two sequences, like uh, you know, you know, sentence in Portuguese, sentence in English, we train this transformer, and then uh, we use this transformer to uh, to uh, generate a sensor reading that is very expensive uh, in real time mm -hmm. using this translator. So it's like a you know interpreter for simulator in some sense. Uh, during the training, but once trained, uh, this is an interpreter on uh, actual system, and input can be easy to measure sensor reading, and the output can be uh, expensive to measure sensor reading. So we have done that uh, uh, not that long. That makes sense. You have a lot yeah. of, um, well, very expensive. Right. So, you yeah. so th yeah, th this can be done on simulation, like, uh, uh, right? Because between simulators. Right. So I can see how this works if, uh, in the transformer, uh, but mm -hmm. it, I mean, I, what I'm imagining is I have this big industrial machine, and I want to see if it's breaking, and I need to know what the sensors inside would have said when I only have mm -hmm. outside sensors. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent can you use a model of the machine itself to constrain the search space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good point too, right? So uh, mm -hmm. if we, but uh, yeah. That, that's a good point, right? So the the dynamics of the model, the movement of the machine can be used uh, maybe as a condition for this uh, you know, sequence translation so that 
uh, we can produce a different uh, sensor reading, uh, expensive you know, a number that yeah. we can measure, uh, given the, the movement of the uh, machine. And if you understand the movement of the machine and how it influenced the uh, uh, you know, sensor reading and these connections, then yeah, it maybe it, it can be also doable. Right. Yeah. I mean, very much the architecture you described. You have. I mean, I would mm -hmm. now think like a transformer. I wouldn't just have mm -hmm. a layer as a simulation. And maybe put it like mm -hmm. so half the thing is a simulation. The other half is the regular transformer, and you know, mm -hmm. some layers mm -hmm. on, on, on. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah. Yeah, on the, on the edges. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it would be like direct extension of your current work with you mm -hmm. rather yeah. yeah. But yeah, well, thank you very much. This is fascinating. It was really valuable. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh yeah, so if you have any question from the audience later, then uh please connect me and absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Thank yeah, you. I'll, I'll talk to you later. Yeah, bye. Bye.